Namaste everyone. Thank you for coming to Berkeley Hindu Yuva speaker event on campus and titled Bhagavad So before we start, just make sure to mute your phone and throughout the event you might have questions that arise. So hold them till the end. We'll have a long QA session where you can ask all your questions um, for JSI Deepak. So let's welcome JSI Deepak onto the stage with a big round of applause. So first, we're going to have Pranita from Berkeley Hindu Yuba present Jaysa Deepak to you with some flowers. Thank you. Now we'll have her do a Ganesh Loka to get the event started. Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Sama Brabha Nirvignam Kurume Deva Sarva Kadeshu Sarvada. The meaning is, O oh God with the twisted trunk, broad body, brilliant as thousand suns, bless me with free freedom from obstructions and hindrances in all my works and for all times. Anyway. Thank you for Pranita for doing the Vandana. So namaste everyone and thank you for coming to Paltam. My name is Shrey and I'm president of Hindu Yuva at UC Berkeley. Hindu Yuva is a student-run non-profit organization with a presence of over 75 campuses across the United States. Our aim is to protect, practice, promote, and protect the Hindu dharma as American Hindus. At Berkeley, we do various events like the Chaturthi, Hindu New Year, and other discussions. So next, we'll have Sayers do a small, um, from, he's from, she's from the Indian Canyon Nation and from the president of the Ontario Indian Movement in uh, California. And she'll do a small invitation. Vishmi Tunis, Panarkat, Canyon, Kaylee, Woman, Sergeant. I come from Indian Canyon Nation, I am to Maloni, but right here, right now, I'd like us to acknowledge the indigenous peoples and language of this land. Can I hear you say Chochenyo? Chochenyo. Can I say, hear you say Huchin? Huchin. The first language of this land is Huchin. This village, before it was known as Berkeley, before it opened, before California, this place is known as Huchin, the indigenous word and indigenous languages of this land. I come from a little further south. My mother, my grandmother taught me when song, ceremony, and dancing stops, so does the earth. And I want to offer a grandmother's song to honor our grandmothers, their grandmothers, and in all of the earth. For without them, and without hers, we would not be here. We share this time and space together for a reason. With that humility, that gratitude, that present on us, I offer this song here in this space. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, it is great to see everybody here. It's great and honor to be here and share just a little bit. Um, I want to tell you a story about what's happening here in California uh, that is something to be really proud and happy about that, that is connected to the indigenous people of this area. Uh, Klamath River is a river that winds from uh, a small town of Klamath Falls, just in the bottom of the southern edge of Oregon, all the way to the Pacific Coast through northern California. Uh, and when the white people settled about 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, about 100 years ago, they started making hydroelectric dams in order to help the people that live there. And I'm sure they meant well. Um, and it brought electrical power there. But it also altered the dam. And um, they thought it altered it in ways that were beneficial, you know, with the creation of reservoirs. And that creates a supply that's sustainable throughout the year. Well, in the last hundred years, it's been very clear that the presence of these dams and these reservoirs have um, not been good for the river. Uh, 50 years ago, even 50 years ago, the Klamath River was world famous for fishing. Um, people came from all over the world. The, the level of tourism in the Klamath River 50 years ago was incredible. Uh, today, there's basically no tourism. Today, nobody really wants to fish in the Klamath River anymore because the water just isn't safe. Uh, the blooming algae and the level of bacteria that's in the state have not uh, made it very ideal for fishing. Well, the native tribes uh, along the river have been speaking up saying this isn't right. And about 20 years ago, an official movement happened that started to reclaim the river, and that meant the taking down of the dams. And if you've heard the news, there are four dams on the Klamath River that are in the process of being deconstructed, and they've actually emptied all of the reservoirs. Um, this is exciting, exciting oh. news. to have J. Sai Deepak Ji with us all the way from Bharat. J. Sai Deepak Ji is a litigator practicing as an arguing counsel primarily before the Supreme Court of India and High Court of Delhi. A mechanical engineer from Anna University, Sai graduated with a bachelor's degree in law from IIT Kharagpur in 2009 and has carved a niche for himself as a litigator in civil, commercial, and, in, and constitutional matters. He has been part of several landmark cases in the High Court of Delhi and in 2019, Sai was presented with the Young Alumni Achievers Award by his alma mater, IIT Kharagpur. He is the author of bestsellers, India That Is Bharat, Colonality, Civilization, Constitution, and India, Bharat and Pakistan, The Constitutional Journey of a Standard Civilization. Saiji will now speak first, and then we will open up for questions after that. Turning it over to Saiji. I don't want to stand. 
Uh, Jashi Ram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's the style of the people standing outside. <laughs> yeah. um, I had a different script in mind, but thank you for giving me such a beautiful opening. I think this is exactly the issue that I wanted to intuitively wanted to speak on. What are the PC filters here? None. Very good. <laughs> I wasn't going to respect any of There you go. So, so I'm going to open the flow for questions at least for an hour so that people have as many opportunities to take a shot with me. Good, bad, and ugly, I don't have an issue with it. If they had any decency, they should have actually come here and they should have used this opportunity to call me and punch me left, right, and center. They should have done that. But I don't give them credit for having brains. You forget it. <laughs> Free speech doesn't exist in their headspace. It's usually, uh, it is, it's human and it's one sided. You know, this is actually the issue. How do you define indigeneity? How do you make sense of it in the context of Bharat? That has been the entire issue. Why is it that decolonization as a subject is so popular and cool when it comes to lands such as America? But why does it become uncool and politically incorrect in land such as Bharat. Should Hindus become a minority on the verge of extinction for their cause to become worthy of representation? Should they concede their physical existence and their spaces in order for them to become a victimized minority? In which case is a minority and particularly a victim, victimized minority the only position from which I can argue a particular issue with a certain semblance of confidence or authority. What is this walk mentality? How does this even work? That is the central question. When you apply the indigenous filter to Bharat, even there what they do is somehow bring in the Aryan invasion theory to say that the, just as the rest of us are colonizers and, and invaders, you two are the same. The synthesis that Bharat has undergone for thousands of years to accommodate multiple points of view and to populate its pantheon of deities to ensure that belief systems across the board are represented is completely lost on such people. The fact that that so-called Vedic deities and so-called native deities are accommodated as part of Bharat's tradition holistically is completely missed. Those who subscribe to a so-called Vedic point of view have Kuladevatas who are non-Vedic so to speak. The henotheism of the Vedic tradition is lost on such people. What is henotheism? Anybody who's understood at least Roman pantheon will, will be able to make sense of this. That is, you carve out a broad canvas of different energy forms and you map local deities onto each of those energy forms. So if the deity happens to have a, dest a destroying character, it immediately is accommodated on the head of Shiva. Because whether it's Shiva, Vishnu or Mahesh, you don't see them as deities or gods in the Abrahamic sense, you see them as tattvas or elements. And once you realize that it's a Shiva Tattva, it's a Brahma Tattva, it's a Vishnu Tattva, which is creation, preservation, and destruction, and you understand this as part of a cycle, then you find the character of a deity. Do you know that even deities have Varna? Deities have Varnas. What a casteist religion. <laughs> By the way, it's UC Berkeley. <laughs> so what does UC stand for? <laughs> Does it have a caste angle to it? <laughs> That's the problem when you when you try and box every conversation into the caste filter. Because Varna is not a caste filter, it is a consciousness filter. And therefore, you look for, so I don't know how many people are from Maharashtra here. Khandoba? Yeah. Where is it? Near Shirdi? Yeah. Right. Which is the tattoo that Khandoba is associated with? Shiva. Shiva. Exactly. 
it's a pastoral deity and since he happens to be the the, the lord of let's say all is pashupati therefore you associate khandoba with shiva or even dattatreya with shiva who is from tamil nadu here ayanar has to be associated with shiva or the closest possible approximation is bhairav this is the nature of bharat if synthesis had been a viable option and i say this with some degree of responsibility i'm sure i'm going to get a lot of feedback for this if synthesis had actually been an option hinduism would have found a way to accommodate other deities from the middle east as well as part of its pantheon provided it had been possible to accommodate those deities in their pre 6th century form for whatever reason okay because the idea is not to replace one with the other but the idea is to find a way to reconcile and accommodate that is the fundamental character of bharat's tradition it is that cultural character that informs the vedic tradition as well now there are two ways of seeing this that this is one all encompassing let's say veil that swallows everything within its rubric and ambit and doesn't allow anything to exist individually it destroys the individuality of a particular deity and that it takes away the individualistic character of a particular panth or a sampradaya or a path that's the common allegation made when you try and say buddha is also treated as a avatar of vishnu these conversations or these strands of conversations did not start until the white man set foot in bharat therefore the question is when i speak of decolonization i am trying to understand what was the native conversation before the outsider chose to distort it i am not saying the society was perfect no society can claim to be perfect but i am certainly asking this question how many of the stereotypes that we receive as wisdom and we pass off as let's say as truisms have emanated from this land as a product of our thought and how much is the product of distortion that is the fundamental question being asked now there is a chance that your decolonial journey might take you to a path where you realize that the system as it existed prior to its entry to was imperfect or, or had room for perfection or improvement then at the very least what you do is that you try and come up with native solutions to those problems and not import solutions from outside which don't work which have only entrenched the problem and made it worse for us to have a conversation because you are going to start from a position of self loathing the moment you think of your native culture therefore no solution that is native would even be acceptable on the table of options that is the problem with the hypocrisy of the left where it chooses to use certain filters as convenient tools of political entry points in certain jurisdictions but when the very same principle and logic is sought to be applied in a different jurisdiction that becomes a fascist concept i have no love lost for hindutva la hindutva for all i care that word can go outside the lexicon and it wouldn't make a difference to me because i'm happy with decolonial hinduism i don't have a problem with it because as long as you choose to see hindutva as a political movement you forget the social undercurrents and what you're saying is that all the people who subscribe to hindutva are automatons they are zombies who are being led by a certain pied piper in a particular direction and they are not capable of individual thinking that we have no urge to free ourselves from the shackles of colonial thought or we don't have the right to do so that's even worse 
the fact that your agency to say that I don't want to subscribe to this anymore, I have seen the destruction that it has wrought on my people and I want to change it, that agency is sought to be deprived from you. That is the central problem. Mighty rich of me to say this in English. <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell me in which other language do I converse you know, with you in? Tell me. The problem is, it's unfortunate that I have to send this message or make this point in the language of the colonizer because that is the audience that I have to reach out to. I didn't have to convince people in the village about the need for the construction of the Ram Mandir. I had to convince the English speaking Hindu. So the problem or the cancer or the virus is in the English speaking Hindu. What do I do? <laughs> exactly. So what else do I do? So this it's, it's, I have to be a part of the matrix to see the matrix and destroy the matrix. <laughs> There's no other option. So then the point is, oh, should we go back to a point where caste was rife, casteism was rife, untouchability was rife. Are these the only starting points of looking at Hinduism? Try and make the very same statement in the context of African culture. Let's see what the consequences are. Your career will be, will be wiped out. That's the end of your career. Why is it okay for somebody to get away with these kind of statements in the context of Hinduism? Why is it okay for people to use ethnocentric, let's say, stereotypes in the context of Bharat, when it's actually accommodated races of all kinds? Because Hinduism is not an ethnocentric religion. It is a consciousness-centric religion. Several tribes have been accommodated. So here's the most controversial statement I can make here and get away with it. The Jati Varna complex has been Bharat's way of accommodating different tribes as part of the Hindu faith system depending on their collective, let's say, consciousness. Which is to say, if it's a warlike tribe, let's slot it the, under the martial category. If it happens to have a mercantile tendency, let's put it in a different category. If it happens to be a tribe which thinks that its pursuit of knowledge is its uh, go-to instinct, then put it under a different category. If somebody is fantastic or has, has dexterity when it comes to use of implements, put them under a different category. That's how it's worked. That's how it's worked. In the process, what has happened? So, one of the theories which is Usually said, and I think the jury is still out or the it's still open on the subject. I don't think I'm presenting conclusive material here. But one of the theories that's said about the Varnajati complex and its evolution is this: that at the at time t zero, Varna is equal to Jati. At time t zero, Varna is equal to Jati, which means there is no barrier, wherein marriages are endogamous, transactions are endogamous, and Varna is seen as an all-encompassing complex wherein your dietary restrictions, your professional restrictions, everything is governed by it. It's a self-sufficient code for each Varna. But then law prescribes something and society runs in a slightly different direction. Because law is usually trying to set a benchmark, but society evolves. So there comes a point where exogamous marriages start. Therefore, Varna is no more equal to Jati. That equality, so to speak, or that calculus is broken. Then you look at the evolution of multiple Jatis. And then you look at the professions that they take up. And in the pre-industrialized era, the, the profession of the father is the profession of the son. Therefore, the hereditary character of professions continues. Now what happens is that you're looking at, okay, you have... Varna as a consciousness filter and now Jati has a birth based coupled with a vocational based filter. How do you enmesh both? Certain professions are then slotted under different Varnas. If it is this profession, it falls into this Varna. So Varna then becomes a broad basket under which you try to map different professions. This is how it has evolved. Now the question is, if I want a decolonial Bharat, what version of Varna Jati complex are we going to look at is what people are going to ask me. How many people give a damn about it in their personal lives anymore? <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> 
It's not as if I'm going to set out something and you'll start following it. So you're, in, you're trying to invent a ghost where none exists. The point is, my history is being weaponized to target me. And those stereotypes have to be dealt with. Now the second aspect is, there is orthodoxy, but in a micro minority. And it is in those communities or groups or families which are still wedded to the institution of the temple. Let me drop the B word here. It's not just the Brahmins. <laughs> it's not just the Brahmins. Because there are temples which are also populated by priests from the non-Brahmin Jatis. I think if my memory serves me right, one of the Jyotirlingas, which is Sri Sailam in Andhra Pradesh. Now is it in Telangana? Telangana. 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 Yes. The Malikajura temple, the priests don't come from the Brahmin Jati, if my memory serves me right. There are many such examples. Now in those institutions, the guardians of the institution, their sole commitment is to the tradition of the institution and not to anybody else. They are not answerable to your PC filters. They are not answerable to your notions of equality. So if you truly want diversity, their commitment is to their institution. How does that affect you should be your, your, uh, your question. You don't aspire to reach those institutions. But your point is because I believe in something, I need to foist it at a certain place. You may not believe in it. So what do they say? I subscribe to this institution. There is a code of conduct that's prescribed for people who are guardians of this institution. Therefore, a handful of families will continue to follow the orthodoxy to the extent possible. Now, it's a dying tradition. Ask these people what it feels to be part of a dying tradition. Where you try to revive it. Your biggest problem with this entire structure is its hereditary character. Let's spread out bluntly. Because it happens to be birth based, you have an issue with it, period. <laughs> is this the only community or the only tradition which has a birth based character to it in the history of the world? No. Nope. Then, clearly, some other phobia is at work. Let's call it what it is Hindu phobia is at work. I'm a white Indologist. True. So ask people who are still interested in the preservation of their Kuladevta Mandirs whether it's easy to find the replacement for the existing Pujari. Because their children are being pulled away in the direction of modernity and you don't know what kind of incentives you are in a position to offer for them to continue with the tradition. And there's a reason why it's important in these institutions for the hereditary character to be retained, I say this bluntly, regardless of what jati that, that the guardian comes from. Because they see the deity as a member of their family. The fear of severing the tradition or deviation from the rituals that are prescribed is real for them. So I happen to work with the former DGP of the idol wing of Tamil Nadu who was responsible for sourcing and tracking idol theft and smugglery across the world. They don't want a tradition, but they want our deities. <laughs> and the most, I mean, the bulk of the, the smuggled goods find their way ultimately to private collections in America. He has a very clear experience based on his first time dealing on the situation. That in those institutions where the priest happens to be a hereditary priest, theft of idols through the connivance of the priest is relatively low compared to non-hereditary priests who do not have a connection with the deity, who see that just as any other job. And when you wish to compare a secular profession with a non-secular profession, you are making a fundamental mistake. It's not just a job. For them, it's not just a job. The limits of secular rationality are tested 
when tradition tries to meet rationality. It's, a, it's, it's not irrational, it's extra rational. Which is, it is beyond the scope of rationality. Now, if you have a problem with that, you should fundamentally have a problem with religion, in which case you don't have a skin in the game, your opinion doesn't count. <laughs> You're a nobody. You're welcome to impose your secular rationality in non-theistic institutions. But in theistic institutions, you have no business imposing your rationality whatsoever. Because the considerations there are very different and particularly when it comes to Hindu tradition, the sheer diversity of it should boggle your mind. Traditions dedicated exclusively to feminine energy. Traditions dedicated exclusively to the masculine energy. Traditions dedicated exclusively to the non-binary energy. So going by equality, those temples where the priests come from the transgender community, should we be asking for access to the priestly position in those temples as well? By those who don't conform to their identity? Would it make sense? I have to use this example because that is the most politically correct example possible today. So my point is, if there is diversity of spaces and diversity of traditions, your entire problem is one size fits all. You're trying to cut the head to fit the hat of secular rationality. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. When you try and understand Bharat through the lived experience of people, as opposed to an outsider's academic experience through books, you should realize how offensive it is for us to read this literature. It is nothing but atrocity literature that was started by missionaries who wanted to civilize us and save our souls. The beginning of this literature is in the 18th century, sorry, in the 16th century, starting with German Lutherans and the Portuguese. Because the British colonizer chooses to enter the country around 1615 when he sets up a port in Surat, but he's in a position to start establishing his institutions only around, I think, the late 1700s, and after 1857, especially after the Sipoy mutiny, when the crown takes over the running of the affairs of Bharat from the East India Company, the British East India Company. And precisely to make this point, and I don't need to sell my book here, just read the extracts that are cited in the book. I cite provision after provision from their chartered acts, which is the charter act is the act under which the British East India Company's license to run Bharat was extended yearly. It was a renewal period. So what was the arrangement between the company and the crown? Bharat was the, 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 the destination for the Dutch as well as for the English. And there was a major fight that took place in Java where there was a massacre, I think, of British soldiers by the Dutch. So the first East India Company is actually the Dutch East India Company and then comes the British East India Company. So, until the, that fight is resolved in favor of the British, they don't, they don't exactly establish their presence in Bharat. Now, the Crown gives a license, a monopoly to the British East India Company under a license, I think, which was given uh, 1600 or January or December 31st, 1519 or somewhere around that. It's the fag end of the year. I think it's in 1600. That's the first license given. Think of it like a like a patent or a copyright, mm -hmm. wherein only one party has the power to transact business with Bharat and that party happens to be the British East India Company, the trading arm of the crown. To the extent that when another gentleman wanted to do business in Bharat without the benefit of such a license, he was taken to court by the British East India Company before the King's Court saying, how does this guy get to violate my exclusive license to do business in Bharat? If you read the judgment and the discussing surrounding the judgment, all notions of Christian equality will crumble. The court rules that under Christian law, it is haram to transact business with the infidel. You cannot transact business with the infidel and the only person who can actually make an exception in favor of the person want, wanting to transact the business happens to be the king because the king is the defender of the faith. 
So much for secularism. Which faith? Christian faith. No, there is only the faith. <laughs> we are in the fight between two the faiths. We are caught in the crossfire. The rest of us are caught in the crossfire. We don't matter. So, it is the faith. He is the defender of the faith. He decides to extend this business or he decides to extend this monopoly since that haram is made halal by the king's license the East India Company has the right to transact business. Therefore another citizen wanting to transact business without the permission of the king is violating two things. Three things. British law, canon law and the exclusive license. And these are discussions written by professors from the West on this subject saying common law has clear biblical origins. When India proudly proclaims we are a common law country, we are not a civil law country, we don't know what we are talking about. So this is how it has worked. Until that period, start at least from the 1700s. Look at several institutions that were set up in the south by German Lutherans who were Protestants. And how the discussion starts about the Aryan invasion theory only after their entry, not until then. Because until then, Dravida was used as a peninsular term, as a geographical term, because there are also Gotras which are from the peninsula. Dravida Gotra, so to speak. It then acquires a racial hue after that. Dravida acquires a racial hue and ethnocentric hue after their entry. Why? Because one German Lutheran missionary understands Shaivism of the South exclusively from the repository of certain non brahmin Adhinams who are Shaivite in character and because that entire repository is written in Tamil, he thinks that Shaivism exclusively belongs to people who speak the Tamil language and he is not exposed to the Shaivite literature which is available in Sanskrit of the North. Typical frog in the well. <laughs> Kupastha Manduka should be the name used for him. Or the better example is Lord Denning, who said, I'm Lord Denning. What I don't know is not worth knowing. <laughs> Indian judges have a tendency to constantly uh, quote Lord Denning. So the point is, these divisions and these discussions start after somebody's entry. I have a right to dissect it. I have a right to understand how did this happen. So, tomes and tomes of literature have been written ever since the publication of the first book by certain geniuses sitting in this part of, uh, of the Atlantic. I have not found a factual counter to anything that I have quoted in the book because I was very careful about one thing that nobody will have the guts to rubbish this as WhatsApp University forward. And I said, I'm going to throw the primary sources at you, even if it comes at the expense of the salability of the book. And all I got was Hindutva fascist, <laughs> upper caste hero, <laughs> civilizational warrior who is the face of a pseudo intellectual movement in Bharat. Yeah, Hindu savage could be another bad. Yeah, that could be. Again, that's what they want to say. Yes. In the process, they have used words like hero and warrior for me. What do I say? <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is this. In the point is, scholarship is responded to with ad hominem attacks as opposed to counter scholarship where you basically question my methodology, my approach and the facts. So let's assume for a moment that you have a problem with the conclusions that I draw on the basis of certain factual talks. I will still ask you one question. I present you 10 facts in seriatim, which are not disjuncted or disjoint, and I'm telling you this is the conclusion, you will, you will have to struggle to come to a very different conclusion based on these dots. Because I have come to a reasonable conclusion, not an extreme conclusion. I am not resorting to hyperbole. I am not resorting to, let's say, unimaginable extrapolation, which has got nothing to do with these facts. The directors of the East India Company, in their minutes, specifically say, as early as 1699, that we must take the word of the gospel to this land. 
and this is supposed to be not even the evangelical arm this is supposed to be the trading arm so what should i expect from the evangelical arm and what should i expect once the crown takes over which is the defender of the faith these are conversations which are branded as fascist it has now become a label to stifle the truth from emerging and in the context of an indigenous faith that is the saddest part and the starkest aspect of leftist hypocrisy both in bharat and here so we will represent those causes which conform to our notions it's my way or the highway effectively okay then the next layer here is assume for a moment that everything that you say is true but there is a political party that's going to take advantage of all of this that makes it very dangerous for the existence of minorities in bharat so your points of view are not taken advantage of uh, by uh, political actors according to you are there no political actors who draw mileage from your positions so your positions are academic they are activist the rest of us are all political automatons we are all zombies who are just walking blindly be behind political actors look at how the conversation is reductive and reduced i say this again i don't care for the political actors but in a democracy i have the right to ensure that my point of view is aired and ventilated by political actors because what use is it if ultimately it doesn't find traction in public discourse and political discourse what's wrong with it if you have a problem with it then you should have a problem with democracy in the first place how is do i get my point of view aired in the in the floor of the parliament this is common sense if it is democracy and according to you every cause and every cross section of people has the right to be represented in a public platform and especially on a political platform why is my cause less deserving of political representation either you believe that the cause itself is unjustified and baseless or even if it is justified it is not deserving of a political representation at least make a position clear i'll respond you can't have it both ways so please when you when you have certain preconceived notions and labels thrown your way about what's happening in bharat by certain publications on the east coast i don't think they know what they are talking about or they know and still they distort which is even worse people who have access to the best possible sources of information the earth while ndtv <laughs> surely know what they are talking about and they don't realize that they constantly further the dog whistle politics whose entire undertone has been a genocidal call against an indigenous faith and its people there are geographical limits of decolonization i realized only recently it stops at the shores of bharat it doesn't enter there after it doesn't enter there after because bharat is the untouchable for the decolonization gap three i think their times up i think their times up and they know it at the very least their voices will not be the sole voices that we know anymore in the market in india in the marketplace of ideas this voice has made its presence felt and it will continue to do so it will continue to do so it will only grow because we have had it we have had enough what does it tell you about the patience of a people if they have to wait for 496 years to reclaim one place through a legal battle which has lasted since when from 1858 november when the first complaint was lodged 
if securing a victory from the highest court of the land on the basis of irrefutable evidence is fascism, I'd like to understand what is true fascism after that. When you do this, when you take away the right of the people to secure or reclaim what is theirs, that too through legitimate, democratic and legal and constitutional means, that is true fascism. Because you're telling them there is a limitation period on their ask. Notwithstanding the fact that they've been constantly asking for it, they've never conceded, they've never relinquished that claim, even by in, in technical terms, going by the law, there has been no abandonment of the claim by the Hindu side. And that's not the only place. Connect this to the first lip of the submission. If I believe in the concept of Kuladevata, I cannot limit myself to the three holiest of shrines because my Kuladevata is more important than any other temple. Which means I have the right to reclaim even the temples belonging to my Kuladevata, whether they are holy or not for others. I can never rest because I have a duty. I have a duty because there is a direct relationship between that temple and my family. And it doesn't matter to me whether the deity is a Vedic deity or a non-Vedic deity. A deity is a deity is a deity according to us. It's an energy space. It's a consecrated energy space that I have a duty to reclaim under any circumstances. And I'm asking for only the legal right to do so. That is the entire problem with the places of worship after 1991. That this legislation is sought to be used as a way of taking away my legal remedy to prove through evidence in a court of law. That I fear the consequences as a believer is something that they don't understand. Because according to them, God is all, God is all about love. That's not us. There are multiple ways of seeing a, a, a deity. You don't understand the different hue, hues of a deity. We don't subscribe to this notion. Keep them to yourself. Don't force your notions of your deity on us. I am happy to live with the consequences of this. Four. As Bharat continues to prosper materially and improves its position, its culture will be heavily under attack. Because that is the entry point for the disseminators of democracy. When people, especially in Bharat, get happy about the fact that the West says the next century is the Asian century, I said, don't fall for these things. They see a market in you and nothing else. Relax. <laughs> Relax. Don't pump yourself up. Especially when someone from the West tries to tell good things about you, be very circumspect. Be very, very circumspect. You don't need their validation, nor should you care for the criticism. Your national interest and your civilizational interest are supreme and primary. That is the sense of realism with which Bharat must operate because its magnanimity has been lost on the world. Now therefore we are forced to rewire ourselves. Each time we have tried to be magnanimous, even in accommodating those who don't wish well for us, we have never been given credit for it. We have only paid the price for it, one way or the other. So don't fall for and don't ever succumb to what I call the Prithviraj Chauhan syndrome. <laughs> At all. You may be magnanimous 12 times. He needs only one time to finish you off. Don't make that mistake. At all. Be real, get real. How does this message land on people who live here and have adopted America as their karma bhumi? Respect the law here, 100%. Build fantastic lives for yourselves, 100%. But continue to have an interest in Bharat's future. Or, as 
assimilate fully and give up your culture and faith so that we know where you stand. <laughs> and also help our other Indian brothers and sisters Absolutely. to stand up because Absolutely. that's their land. The survival of Hindu dharma in the mothership and outside will serve as an inspiration for all other indigenous cultures which are struggling to regain themselves and revive themselves. <laughs> the existence of Hindu dharma will make it possible for everybody else to exist. I don't know if I can say this of everybody else. It is a hope. So please realize what you represent. And I say this with responsibility that those who subscribe to the, the ethos of this platform, and I leave it at that, have a duty to make sure that you make your presence felt in American public life because it needs sane voices now before it is taken over by the mob standing outside. You have a duty. Someone's recording. <laughs> When America is going through an identity crisis of all sorts, the sanest possible, possible voice that can step up and restore a semblance of sanity to this place has to be our voice. Because we don't present a threat to anybody's existence. We have no problems with it. We do not have a vested interest. We do not have an agenda. Our agenda has been survival. That's, that's possibly the lowest possible denominator in the scale of agendas. Expansionism is not our goal. Europe has either fallen or is in the process of falling. The last surviving outpost of the West is this country which was established, from what I understand, as Nova Europe or the New Europe. And now this country is being taken over by forces which don't respect democracy, which don't respect free speech, which don't respect diversity, but use it as a weapon. So in your interest, and in American interest, and in Bharati interest, it is important for Hindu Americans to step up and make themselves count in American public life. It's not an easy ask. But from what I understand, you enjoy the goodwill of the establishment by and large because you are not seen as troublemakers. You have only contributed positively and constructively to the growth of this land and its economy. Use that goodwill and make sure that people understand your concerns. If you do not take part in policy discussions and you limit yourself to earning your livelihood, your existence will be pixelated from the public space. It will be airbrushed. So whether you like it or not, it has now become a survival based or an existential imperative. Gone are the times and the days. When you could have said, I don't need to participate in this because I'm interested in the parity between the rupee and the dollar and send back remittance to my home. <laughs> that was generation one. You're at least in the third generation. So in the order of Maslow's needs, you're at least at the third level. You don't get to say any of these things anymore. You don't have the luxury of offering these excuses and pretexts. I'm not asking you to not have a life. I have one myself, contrary to popular perception. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible to strike a balance between both, between having a life and also contributing to dharma. I make no compromise on my lifestyle whatsoever. Because I don't believe in celebrating poverty merely because I happen to represent dharma. That's an absolute bogus. If it is dharma or the kama moksha, Dharma is not possible without Artha. You need resources to make Dharma happen. 
So I don't suffer from self-imposed poverty at all whatsoever. Finally, before I open this up for questions, people in Bharat have your back. Don't forget that. The very purpose of this visit is to say there will be a chorus, your voice will never be lonely. 100%. We have your back. And I say this as a member of the society and not as a representative of any political outfit. I have no connections whatsoever. And dare I say this, positions taken by society have greater permanence than political parties. Yes. <laughs> they, are, they are less transient. So this comes as a societal covenant, not a political promise which lasts only for five years or less. <laughs> Questions please. Yeah, so for questions, we'll all, uh, we can line up from here, uh, and one by one, people will get a chance to ask. Short introduction, crisp questions. If it's only a comment, I don't have a problem. And if you certainly have a problem with my position, feel free to ask. I have no, no problem possible. And please uh, also try to not repeat questions. Yes. Okay. I'll start off with the first one. Um, so. So I'll start off with the first one. Um, Bhar Bharatam is the name of this event. Um, and it is Bharatam instead of India. How, or India. Um, how can we, what, what does it mean to, what do we mean by Hindu Rashtra, Hindu nationalism, the Indic perspective, the Indic res res uh, Renaissance, and what is ultimately the difference between using the word Bharat in India? This is Sarva. So, I've answered these questions a million times, and I think I should, I should at least collect a dollar for each. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you use Hindu nationalism, there are Second World Warish European connotations associated with it. And that's why the other side uses it so frequently. Let's call it a decolonial reclamation project of an indigenous community. As, as I say, I mean, as lawyers, we don't care for what the document says it is. We are more interested in what the document is about. So I'm less interested in the word Hindu nationalism or Hindutva, I'm more interested in the outcomes and the means. Taking back my identity, if, it, if that poses a threat to someone else's identity, that means fundamentally my identity is a loggerhead with yours. You're telling me as long as you keep your identity at a distance, both of us can pe uh, co co uh, coexist peacefully. Isn't that a subtle threat? It's a subtle threat. It's a subtle threat where street veto threatens to kick into action the moment I wish to reclaim my identity. So, reclamation of the civilizational and religious identity of Bharat does not come at the expense of and does not pose a threat to anybody else who thinks that they can coexist with the Hindu identity. But those who have a problem with that identity will have a problem with it no matter what. It's not as if a secular Bharat has been a haven and paradise of peace. Going by the track record. 
and we know how it all starts. We know the triggers. So if the status quo is going to be no different, I might as well reclaim what is mine and still live with the status quo. What have I gained by giving it up? Because those who choose to exist without dignity deserve neither peace nor dignity. As simple as that. So reclamation of Hindu dignity and its civilizational presence as an indigenous faith is what Hindutva ultimately stands for. Its existence has been necessitated by the existence of forces which have always been inimical to it. Had that not been the case, we wouldn't have needed it in the first place. It's a special purpose vehicle. Two, safety of minorities, religious minorities in Bharat has never been contingent on the existence of a constitution, as the Jews they tell you this. In Cochin. They've lived for thousands of years. Every persecuted community thinks of Bharat as a homeland or at least as a safe haven. Even the Afghans for that matter. So we, if we haven't posed a threat to those who were fleeing the Taliban or those who were fleeing the Romans or those who were fleeing our friends from the Middle East when they gave up their lands which were originally called Aryan or Iran who do we pose a threat to? And if somebody poses a threat to us, they also pose a threat to those who are running away from them. People shouldn't forget that. That's the associative property at work. <laughs> so, as I said, our existence in decent numbers provides a safe umbrella for everybody else. And hence Bharat. No self-respecting civilization should call themselves by a name that's been given to them by somebody else. Bharat is the name we've always given to ourselves. India isn't a name that we've given to ourselves. Just as Iran chose to revert to Iran as opposed to Persia, we have a right to do so as well. Does that, yeah, does that make India Iran? That would be the stupidest comparison people will start with. <laughs> Understand the point. Understand what the logic of the principle involved here. Next. So just a question. So uh, we talk about dharma a lot, right? Sanatana dharma. So one of the essence of dharma is yato dharma stato chaya. Yes. And uh, what we also see that yato vira stato dharma. So with that being said, the essence of one of the key essence of uh, Sanatana dharma is the martial aspect of it. Right? right. So we know for a fact that even though the history books uh, right has taught us something else. Right. Uh, our ancestors have beaten the invaders to pulp and they have chased them away numerous times, right? So, with that being said, uh, where, where do you see the current generation? And as part of reviving Sanatana Dharma, how important, we know for a fact that it is important to revive the martial aspect of it. Where do you see, why is there so much of gap? Yeah, even during the British period, we have so much of the freedom fighters and that uh, have come up to fight the invaders. Correct. And so why do you see that gap? And how do you think that uh, we can fill this gap? Right. So, when you look at how pre Christian Rome and Europe fell, and several parts of the Middle East fell, and how Constantinople became Istanbul. <coughs> I don't see why we must ever think of ourselves as a defeatist or a defeatist civilization. We are still here. So a lot of us say, if you were so great, why did you lose? We are the only ones here. <laughs> Japan was protected by geography from the Mongols and by, of course, what they call the divine men, kamikaze. But the rest of us living in the crossroads of Central Asia, which is such a 
it's it's seen as the place to occupy. Hence, a great game between the British and Russia and whatnot. But the Himalayan, let's say, spur is the object of 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 let's say of the object of lust of a lot of people because access to resources, access to the crossways of, of Asia. That's what everybody is actually waiting for, and we are still here in significant possession of Himalayas to everybody else's pain. So we are not a defeated civilization. That aspect of our history has been deliberately, some, uh, let's say, it's been brushed under the carpet. Wonderful people such as Vikram Sampath and others, Dr. Meena Shijan before him, have been writing about this. We will continue to. In the second book, India, Bharat and Pakistan, I've actually spoken of the contribution of the revolutionaries. The Congress of that period was full of status quoists. The ones who constantly kick the door and push the envelope were the revolutionaries who would force the Congress to push the envelope in their ask when, uh, when it comes to the British government because public would say, if the revolutionaries are asking for freedom, why are you asking for dominion status? <laughs> Unless your entire objective or goal was to stay in power in cahoots with the British. Please understand, revolutionaries did not fail. They martyred themselves, may have individually failed, but collectively they succeeded. That's the point we, we always fail to understand. So think of them, of Ahutis in a Yajna, where the Yajna has succeeded at the expense of their lives. And that's exactly how they saw themselves. They were Samitas in a Yajna, period. They were Shakti worshippers at the end of the day. Every one of them. Every one of them. Anushil and Samiti, established by Aurobindo and others, drew inspiration from a Shakti worshipper whose guru was a Shakti worshipper, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa to Vivekananda to Aurobindo. That's the connection. They would read, and Swami Vivekananda's brother was one of the revolutionaries as part of Anushil and Samiti. They wrote, uh, they published uh, journals such as Yugantar. So when you read the history of Bharat's revolutionary period, it is astounding. You know why? They were truly dharmic warriors in action who didn't care for public sentiment or public support and who continued to do what they wanted to, what they were supposed to, without regard for popularity. Because there was a point when if the, if the Congress sneezed, the, the, uh, the newspaper would immediately report it. But these guys would actually cough blood and they would die. Nobody would give a damn. That is the essence of the Gita in action. Where somebody says, I am doing this for posterity and for the liberation of my land, not salvation. We believe in liberation, not salvation. Such a group has secured us our freedom. And that's precisely why after so many generations and decades, people are remembering them. And we know who the true traitors were, who were the collaborators, who wanted to stay in power. <coughs> there are enough people who chose the peaceful route as well and still sought for independence. Those are two different groups. So for instance, several revolutionaries, including the Chapekar brothers, claim to have been inspired by Tilak. That's exactly why the British threw him into jail saying that he was responsible for instigating Chapeka brothers into killing the, I think, the collector of Pune. And the reason was, I think in Pune at that time, it was hit by the bubonic plague. And it was so badly handled, so badly handled that millions of people died, or at least thousands of people died. And so the Chapeka brothers drew inspiration from the speeches of Tilak and they decided to pull the trigger. Therefore, Tilak was accused of having engineered it. Now the point I'm trying to make is, one, we are certainly not a defeated civilization. There's been a martial trade for as long as I know. History books and the constant drone of pacifism has been the reason why we have chosen to submerge that aspect of our collective character. Being peaceful and being a pacifist are two different things, just as use of violence and use of force are two different things. That is the distinction that we fail to strike. One is necessary, the other is unnecessary and wanton. 
anything that becomes necessary is justified and legitimate on the angles of morality. Because you are saying, if somebody decides to attack you and if I have to defend myself to protect myself, that's sheer necessity. If I have to be a pacifist, I should simply lie down and, and put down my arms and finish. I should say, okay, you finish my, my life before you, I even pick up the weapon to defend myself. Right? So I don't think we should subscribe to the notion of pacifism. I've said this before. Be peaceful. I have no problems with it. That Gita clearly says, certainly be peaceful. But if someone pushes you to do something that is adharmic, or you have to do something for the protection of dharma. Kshatra will prevail, period. The spirit of the Kshatra will prevail. And the history of Bharat also tells you that the role of the Kshatriya was performed by several jatis depending on the time. It was not limited exclusively to those coming from the Kshatriya Varna. This is to again bust the myth that it's a rigid, ossified structure. There were certain aspects of it which could have been better. I don't deny that ever. I am not going to deny that ever. But it, your question should be, do I throw out the bath water or the baby with the bath water? Ask that question always. Don't lose sense of proportion and perspective when you ask these questions. Next. Thank you. You are under no compulsion to clap at the response. Please. It's okay. <laughs> So, I, I, uh, my name is Sarvesh Ravind and uh, I'm a second year mechanical engineering student. I also want to pursue a career in aerospace specifically. Um, so, my question is, I've currently started the Hindu Yuba um, organization at my college, and I'm currently the president. And a question I had is, how can we deal with protests such as what just happened outside? So, recently when the Ram Mandir was open, my friends and I, we all walked out with Kurtas, the Tirat, and uh, we all walked around campus the whole day like that, right? But we got multiple name calling, so we were called Hindu nationalists, right. um, uh, unbucks, everything. Okay. So by multiple organizations like the Pakistan uh, organization, the, um, the Sikh Student Association, all right. of them uh, were just going on name calling. So what is the best way to um, not only defend ourselves, but also make ourselves be known as, like, make, make ourselves clear that we are Hindus, and we are proud of it, but also that we don't need harm to other people just because they're Hindu. Right. Okay. Why do you care? <laughs> Why do you care? Are you trying to convince them of your bona fides? If you try, do you think you'll succeed? No. Are they willing to be persuaded or convinced? Screw them. <laughs> Of your cause. Why? That's exactly what Sri Aurobindo cautioned against. He called it Chakshulaja. Which means you want to make your cause seem right and correct to everyone who's even an unwilling audience. It doesn't matter. Was your Pran Krishna celebration stopped successfully? No. You went ahead with it? Yes. That's it. As long as you get your way, it doesn't matter. You are not stopped, you have not been physically harmed, why do you care? Your audience is the fence sitter who is confused or who is uninterested or who is uninformed without a position. I can't be convinced by the crowd sitting outside. Neither can I convince the crowd sitting outside because we know that our positions are intense positions and we have committed ourselves to those positions. For good or bad. My interest is in the audience which wants to understand our position. If they had shown the interest to talk and to ask me questions, I would have given them the respect due to any other person. I have suffered the, the let's, let's say, I have put myself through the misery of having to listen to their side and their institutions. As a participant, I have gone to all their strongholds, from Ashoka University to JNU. <laughs> Wearing the saffron kurta, with posters being plastered on the wall saying, Brahmin, go back. 
I said, I'm going to go to the bathroom. It didn't make a difference to my life. Either embrace those labels or behave like a tax back. Water down a tax back. Doesn't make a difference. Once you have chosen to be a part of this Ahuti, remember, all of this will come your way. Neither should your adulation make a difference. Nor should the breakdown make a difference. You are answerable to your conscience and to the law. Period. Law, strategically, conscience, ethical. Have that sense of clarity. You are proudly wearing the Vibhuti. There is a Rudrakshamada. What are you afraid of? Our spiritual practices must give us the reed ki haddi and the vertebracy needed to put up with this nonsense. Don't worry. I am very happy that your physical symbols are so intact. I have nothing to tell you except for the fact, don't care. <laughs> don't care. Continue with your work. More power to you. Next. Hi, uh, my, my name is Vinit Shyam, and uh, I actually graduated from UC Berkeley in 1988, and I grew up in America. So, um, I've had a perspective of an outsider looking um, in at India for over five decades, and uh, during that period, I've learned and seen a lot of propaganda: New York Times, the media, academia in the West. And the, one of the frustrating aspects has been for these decades is that there's a certain passivity on the Indian side. Um, there's this uh, comfort in suck them in the diet they right. the truth will win right. which you know, may be true but we don't know if it will take a thousand years or right. ten years um, but watching the West in political campaigns here one thing I've seen is they set up something called a war room right. which is more about a prompt and particular rebuttal That's in a timely true. manner right. and what has happened over decades is the New York Times writes their article and you know literally factually inaccurate and certainly misrepresents the truth. Right. Yet there's no response. You know, the, the ambassador, I mean the government, any institution, right. nothing comes out. My question to you is, um, shouldn't there be a systematic effort to set up kind of a war room in right. India, maybe by the government, maybe by other institutions, maybe by other actors, that promptly respond within hours, right. within 12 hours of the New York Times article, which mistakes the facts, misrepresents the data, I mean, our article came out you know, yesterday about the economics, and right, instead right. of being positive, it's negative, of course, and caste and all these. Right. So, what, what are your thoughts on, on learning from the West their methods of political battle, right. uh, the political aspect of the civilizational battle, and setting up a war room that promptly responds to their highly refined and sophisticated propaganda operation that comes to the West? I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And uh, I know for a fact, without revealing details and names here, that at least Private players who are interested in the Hindu civilization cause are certainly working on some of these exact initiatives that you refer to. But here's one thing that I'd like to tell you. Sometimes it helps to be the person who sets the narrative as opposed to someone who responds to the narrative. And perhaps that is equally a strategy that must go hand in hand with the response movies. What do you want me to respond to or what should be the quality of response? To a caricature of the New York Times after the launch of a space race in Bharat. Mm -hmm. What do you think should be a response? According to me, they have done a great service to us and our cause by publication by publishing the caricature. Because that reveals their true nature. That for all their claims of being liberals and the true liberals of this country, they are racists of the first order. Rank Hindu force. So I don't think that everything merits a response, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a response mechanism either. I agree. I certainly agree. Next. Hello, I'm Vini Vashishan, and um, my question is how is the language used as a tool for politics in India? So uh, we have many languages, so I think there are political parties using it as a language. That's my question. Can you, perhaps the question hasn't landed on me then. Why yeah. don't you rephrase it better? So I'm trying to say like how are uh, the different languages in the South right. used as um, a tool for politics? Fine. Oh, no idea. 
should have mentioned the South Indian food. <laughs> <laughs> My Dravidian brothers. <laughs> Sorry, Dravidian brothers, there's a difference. So, Yes, please. So I think even the scriptures, right? They, I think they're also like you know twisting it in their and probably tunnel and then adding it up into the. Are you saying tunnels in the scriptures? No, no, no. <laughs> Sanskrit scriptures. I, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, see, uh, when you try to understand the Dravidian movement, the ist is important because it speaks of an ideology. The ear shouldn't be used in isolation because it speaks of a people or a geography. That's why I'm careful about calling it Okay. Um, you must realize that the political actors who act as fronts are actually just fronts. Left to themselves, they have no brains, nor do they have the resources or the strategy for it. Because they are being run by people from Europe and other places who have invested in the evangelization of southern parts of Bharat for at least 150 years. The simple trick or let's say thumb rule is follow the money. Wherever they get funds from and however it's rooted or routed in your language, you will know who's interested in pushing what. And I think they reveal their cards according to me too prematurely when members associated of, uh, to a certain religious institution choose to uh, oppose the opening of the Kodan Kulam reactor. That was the first time the rest of Bharat became aware of this nexus. While the nexus was always known to us from the south. And it was always visible in the scripture and the literature of this ideology. And the arguments were lifted specifically from missionary material. There is no imagination there. And there is no transmission loss between the missionary position and the revenue's position. At all whatsoever. You compare, as they say in Delhi, maki ka maki, you'll find the same thing. Word for word. So, to the extent that they even replicate the mistake in commerce. <laughs> that is true, so that's how we catch copyright infringement in certain cases. So, in software infringement cases, what they call is that when you develop a software, you put in what is called an Easter egg. That equally helps in establishing infringement because you know the sense in which you planted the egg. Whereas the copycat doesn't. He is just blindly copying. And that's how you say, you please explain why, why was this present in the code in the first place? Why was this space present? Why was this comma present? That is how you identify that the revivalist argument is a literal lift from the missionary position. Okay? The good part about what happened a few months ago, I think in September 2023, where the junior Rahul Gandhi from the south. <laughs> specifically asked for eradication of Sanatana Dharma and made it absolutely clear to all of us as to what their ultimate goal is, which we've been trying to say for the last two, uh, two decades. We said their animus towards a particular jati is actually a precursor to their animus towards a particular faith. This is only plan A. The good part is all other jatis have woken up now. I know this because I'm in conversation with some of them. They've realized that they have been misled for generations by creating a hate figure and by, by being allowed to be used as means for something else. They didn't know this or they knew and they thought they would win. That's how the left and Islamists typically work. Each one thinks they will trump the other when they come to power. We know who always wins. So the good part is in the age of internet it's very difficult for somebody to think that their bluff will not be called out because there's a lot of material available in the public domain which allows us to trace it all back. There was a tyranny of language all these years because people wouldn't make sense of or would not be interested in something published in Tamil. But now people have started translating those works so that people can know what kind of secessionist separatist material was being fueled and funneled through revenue uh, ideology. It's a matter of time, it'll take some time, but it'll happen under it. And don't discount that there is a rising tide of saffron there. I think the conditions are right. And situation will change. People will realize what is at stake. Maybe it will take 
15 20 years before another political option finally occupies center stage in the land of dharma which is tamil nadu that will happen and i hope to be a part of the process in terms of being a catalyst to that particular effect through my public engagement and also by constantly exposing the literature from the 17th century onwards which is why i started writing on that subject thanks to the swadhanandi stalin statement i have been writing a series in the indian express tracing the origins of the uh, revolutionist sentiment and how they actually advocated for secession which continues to be their ultimate goal they are just actually biding their time waiting for the right opportunity no wonder they kept supporting all sorts of terrorist elements next Yeah. Just uh, a second. I need to check with the organizers. How long do I have? I have no interest in more saying my welcome. Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, I'll take two more questions and then back. Yes. It's an honor to be speaking. So this question of mine arises from my personal. Okay, I'll give you ten minutes. Go on. <laughs> you don't need to size hold me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this this question of mine arises from a personal experience of mine over the past five years or so. Yes. So uh, you you answered this partly in your talk, but I would like to answer. Uh, Get on specifically with this. Yes, so uh, we were four friends in India. Uh, two of us came here for our masters. We continued our work here, and two of them stayed back. At least in my opinion, uh, their bar of practicing Hinduism in their own way is much higher than what I can do here. Uh, in in that in their perspective, uh, the way that I've uh, created created the economic opportunities for myself is better than what they are able to do there. Okay. So I feel this is an unfortunate thing that right. we have to choose between this black and white. Correct. Correct. Do you think this is a good thing for the Hindu uh, community as a whole to try and continue, or should we change our minds or or altogether for thinking of third perspective? Yes. See, if you look at the issue from their perspective, you can't entirely be unsympathetic to their position, but they don't know. that there are people here who also miss their ability to practice dharma to the fullest possible extent or to be in touch with their roots now that might seem like a problem of the affluent from their perspective it's like having a rich man's disease okay so i think each stage and each position has its own pros and cons which is one of the reasons that i strongly believe that economically successful bharat is equally important for a culturally successful bharat for multiple reasons which is why i don't see economics and culture and religion in silos at all the more people you lift out of poverty the lesser is the ability for someone to harvest souls <laughs> i'd rather have rice bags handed out to the public distributed system by or rather than indians <laughs> okay i'm more interested in ensuring see see you have to realize the softer aspects of it when you're part of a poor nation the overall pride in the nation is at a low that is that that's when you are at your most vulnerable for extraction okay so i certainly believe that with time with growing opportunities in bharat they will realize the value of being able to secure their livelihood in bharat and also secure their dharmic positions in bharat that has to happen why else would the diaspora try to create or build temples in bharat if they have no interest in it or rather in in the us if they have no interest in it right the worlds will meet the, the twain shall meet at some point uh and i can say this as someone who has who has climbed the social ladder or the economic ladder so to speak the hard way like any other middle class family from south the times have changed there are more opportunities and the test of more opportunities is perhaps you can you can perhaps say it's a crude example previously the return on investment or the opportunities were the stem sectors that's why you found a lot of people from my generation opting for engineering or medicine at at best arts wasn't an option and in the south law also wasn't an option you were literally the black sheep in the black hole <laughs> when i chose to make the transition i was asked if i was in a substance <laughs> i had never even taken a whiff of anything in my life and still have 
ever. I have come from IIT Kharagpur. Ask people what happens there. <laughs> and I'm in the legal profession. From the frying pan into the fire. Still nothing. So I think when people have the ability and the freedom to pursue diverse professions and professional choices, that's a proof of a thriving economy and multiple business initiatives which present themselves as employment options. So it's changed. It has started changing. I see a lot of people jumping into photography after having pursued five years of law. Says something. And these are not people exactly from uh, uh, families of means. If they come from an affluent family, I can understand it. But they come from normal families who have chosen to make the transition because they believe that the market is presenting them with those options. This is something that only time will answer. And I've said this in my uh, engagement uh, yesterday at Stanford that Bharat's economic success is only a matter of time and it is destined for sure. Even if you go with pure economic calculation as to how markets are emerging and how the tide is turning, 100% this is the place because it's a potential market and every potential market presents an opportunity for growth and since Western development model functions on relentless growth, it will go to a market which is growing. Therefore, more opportunities will come there. I just hope their lack of respect for environment doesn't follow. I'm more interested in that. That you somehow strike a balance between development, property, and government. That is the trifecta for us. Next. Uh, so, uh, I had two questions, but I think I'll stick to one. Okay. So, uh, my name is Sumant Ranapati. I am a first year at Berkeley, uh, originally from Bangalore. So, uh, my question is, I attended your programs, program yesterday and heard your Stanford's uh, program okay. yesterday. So, based upon that, I have a question. So, if we want to achieve the goals of decoloniality and decolonization entirely uh, in the democratic framework, yes. what is our response to electoral transactionalism like what happened in Karnataka last right. year, right. Right. where freebies enticed folks away as much as I can see it? Okay. What a brilliant question. This is the issue that I've been trying to address. Thank you so much. In response to my book, first book, I got a personal email from Mr. Pratabhan Mehta in 2021. And he wrote a personal email saying, "It's I love the book. I don't understand why do we disagree so much on politics. I wrote to him, your mistake is in assuming that I'm interested in the political agenda. When I'm interested in the societal change. I'm more interested in changing the rules of the game as opposed to the players involved. Okay? He then selected that book as one of his top five picks for 2021. Last year, he wrote a piece rubbishing the book as a front for a pseudo intellectual movement. <laughs> Multiple personality disorder. <laughs> so, I'm very clear. That decoloniality from a Hindu perspective is primarily and has to be a societal change in the first place because that will trigger better political options. That is the hope. My investment is difficult, but it's in the long term. The number of people in bureaucratic positions or people who are aspiring to enter Indian bureaucracy services, the civil services, that is the audience that I'm always trying to cater to. So people don't know this. So one of my first public engagements started with Rajya Sabha TV inviting me for discussions on constitution and on judgments from the Supreme Court when I was a junior associate in a law firm. And that's when I realized that this platform has a huge reach among the civil service aspirants. Allow me to crack a joke here. If I wear a burqa and go to some of these places, I'll be recognized. <laughs> okay. Because that audience has been watching all of this. And that audience is the one that's being fed the colonial syllabus that continues in bureaucracy training still. So once they go there, there are only two possibilities. I read this and I read this. What do I subscribe to? I want a state of confusion because that is perfect for my intervention. So to answer your question, you're 100% correct. Decoloniality, if it ends up being or if it ends up putting all its eggs in the political basket, it will be an utter failure because it will be subject of it will be subject to multiple compromises and it will be 
vulnerable to wheeling and dealing. No matter who, no matter what party, you have to realize to reach a certain position in any jurisdiction in politics is not easy and it requires multiple compromises to be made on the, on the aspect of principle. If I operate from a position of principled intransigence, my investment therefore has to be in the right audience, my investment is in the societal audience which will force and ask uncomfortable questions of the politician when he chooses to compromise on our interest. That is how I choose to use democracy to my advantage in favor of my cause. So I'm hoping that the silent thinking audience will no more be silent, it will think more, it will consume this material and start asking the right questions. To put it bluntly, my investment is in the middle class Hindu or the affluent Hindu who still cares for dharma. These are the two strata that I am strategically investing in and that has been abundantly clear for a very long time. Otherwise, as you rightly said, the previous government in Karnataka promised at the outset that it would free temples from state control and then abandoned that within a period of a year or two years. And all sorts of excuses were offered for it. That is how politics operates. But the good part is, since that issue was already in public domain and a significant traction had been achieved, people started asking these questions. Why do you now talk about freeing temples from state control when the other party is indulging in ransacking temples and looting its property? What did you do when you were in power? That is what my, my critiques miss, or my critics miss when they think that I support the position of a political party. They, they don't realize I support a position. Whoever is in a position to deliver the goods on that position will get my vote, period. Assume for a moment that somebody else had chosen to deliver an article 370 around that movie. Would you have said don't do it? No. <laughs> Would you have said really? Ye to kisi aur ka kaan, aap kyo kare? That's all. We are interested in the work. But the unfortunate reality is that only one was interested in doing it. <laughs> and that is a terrible situation if you are in a Hindu position because you don't have too many options to choose from. And therefore you are held ransom to the women fancy of a particular organization. So I am clear that existing options need to be improved. At the same time, the society needs to start thinking of putting pressure to get the job done at multiple levels. I am arming the society with information and with the ability to form their own opinions through ways of looking at a certain problem, period. Final question. Regarding the citizenship of India, that yes, so it was introduced in 2019, but it means like four years. Uh, the rule should not be notified. Yes, it's going Marty, to be. I think there are not eight extensions. Exactly, and but like it's been delayed, and now correct, it's correct. Much, they will have, have the regulations. So uh, we are hearing stories about the conversions, uh, like this, the Christian, uh, Christian Hindu of the refugees, of the refugees. Correct. Also, the Indian Muslims and the Muslims from Bangladesh, all they have like protested, participated in riots in India, and they've been persecuted. What are your views, like how it's going to make CA is going to protect our like deepen our rights in our country, uh, as well as like how it is going to help us like lay us a foundation and uh, this ties into what the previous gentleman asked, and I think when I asked this question, the point is if you introduce something as symbolism and you don't follow through, it creates a sense of disillusionment. And to forget your dissolution, it affects people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of it. They already are coming from a hellhole called Pakistan, where their daughters are lifted wholesale in broad daylight to be sold away or to be prostituted. That is the reality of it. And someday Pakistan will pay the price for everything that is done to the feminine energy. It will. It will revisit them in very nasty ways. But the point is, knowing that. You shouldn't offer this kind of hope and take it away from them. It's cruel. I agree with you and I don't know, I'm not in a position to decipher or deconstruct the reasons for it. COVID was an excuse until some time, but COVID has not proven to be an excuse for election values, for God's sake, let's be real. <laughs> so, I genuinely hope that those who had the right intentions to introduce the CA completed before the purpose of bringing them back here as Hindus is defeated. What's the point? 
I agree with you. I have. I couldn't have ended this on a better note. Thank you for the session. Thank you. I have no Thank you for a patient getting as a lawyer would say before a Supreme Court. Thank you. <laughs>